everyone. My name is Colleen Stewart. I'm the communications coordinator for the New Hampshire Food Alliance, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our September Network Cafe. Uh, this is the first Network Cafe, a part of our 2023-2024 Network Cafe series. Uh, the New Hampshire Food Alliance holds Network Cafes on the first Friday, except for today, um, of each month, September through April, um, and these are informal, lively conversations um, with our partners from New Hampshire, food system, and beyond. Um, and network cafes are just one part of our work here at the New Hampshire Food Alliance, um, and we are a statewide network coordinated by the Sustainability Institute at UNH uh, that engages and connects people dedicated to growing a thriving, fair, and sustainable local food system here in the Granite State. Um, so before we get started, I just have a couple acknowledgements and things to point you towards on that agenda um, that I shared in the chat. And I think Nicole can continue to share that as others join us. Um, so as a program of UNH, um, we join them in being committed to building and nurturing an environment of inclusive excellence where we can all thrive. Uh, we join UNH in the belief that diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion are foundational values inextricably linked to achieving our core educational mission and embracing the many characteristics of our community members that make all of us uniquely ourselves. Um, also, as part of UNH and our values of diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, uh, we want to just read part of UNH's Land, Water, and Life Acknowledgement. And you are welcome to listen to the whole thing, which is linked in our agenda. Um, as we all journey on the trail of life, we wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connection the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples have maintained to Indakina, homeland, which the University of New Hampshire community is honored to steward today. Okay. One last thing before we get started, um, just want to direct everyone's attention to the agenda, to the desired outcomes and working agreement that are on that agenda. Both of those things will provide us some guidance as we learn and connect with each other for the next hour. So just take a look at those, um, feel grounded in those, and I will pass it to my colleague, Nicole, who will provide an introduction to today's topic. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, that's perfect, Ellen. Yeah, the next one. Um, so I'm Nicole Cardwell. I'm the program director for the New Hampshire Food Alliance. I'm very excited to see you all and welcome you all today. We and I'm and I'm extra thrilled to be welcoming Ellen Kaler, who's the executive director of Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and the um, founder and fearless leader of the New England Food System Planners Partnership, um, which is indeed a mouthful but is essentially a partnership of the six New England states food systems networks um, and Food Solutions New England. You can see the partners that represent on the screen here. And the New Hampshire Food Alliance has represented New Hampshire in this partnership for years now. And we recently were um, excited to welcome the New Hampshire Department of Ag, Markets and Food as an official partner as well. So the partnership, as you may no, recent um, commissioned and researched a report, Ellen, you can go to the next slide, um, a regional approach to food system resilience, which was released a couple of months ago. Um, and many of you have been anxiously awaiting this report and the data within it for a long, long time. Um, and it's a lot to take in. I know I feel that way and that I've heard that from many of you, but it's a lot of phenomenal foundational food systems data about New England and about New Hampshire that is brought together in this really beautifully curated report. And the data and information in it is really meant for all of you. It's meant for um, fundraising, for advocacy, for strategic planning. And we, as the New Hampshire Food Alliance, wanted to use the series this year, the Network Cafe series, to help you understand the data within it, to get a sense of the breadth and the depth of the data provided so that it's a little bit more digestible, a little bit more accessible um, to you all in your work. Um, so that hopefully it'll help us all do our work better and then ideally help us work more strategically together as a region. Um, so Ellen, if you could go to the next slide. So this report has um, four volumes. Up one more. Um, so it has four volumes, and we're going to use the series 
to dig into each one of them. So today we have Ellen Kaler. She's going to give us some context. What is the New England Food System Planners Partnership? Why this report? And why was she passionate about this idea and this focus for the report? Um, and then give us some sense of the data. I want her to give us, she's going to give some examples. She's going to share some New Hampshire specific data with you all. Um, and then I've asked her to share a little bit about what she thinks is next for all of us as a region, but also specifically for New Hampshire. Um, and then throughout the series this year, the research team lead for each of the volumes that you see here is going to come and do something similar. Share maybe 20 minutes of information, some of their favorite charts and graphs and data to come out of the research and then be available to answer your questions so that in real time, we can all understand this data better and figure out um, just how you can best dig into it. Um, so that that is all I was hoping to say. Ellen, I'm going to hand it off to you to dive in um, to this to this phenomenal report. And you're muted. I'm gonna... Great. Thank you so very much. Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you, Nicole and. Colleen for inviting me, uh, really, really terrific. Um, in fact, this cafe series is gonna get replicated in some form in Vermont starting later this month. And I think Maine and maybe some of the other New England states are also thinking about it. So, so excited to see this series happen. It's a great way to dig into the data. And as Nicole said, um, there is quite a lot of data. Uh, so just to, to kick it off and basically uh, give a disclaimer, uh, I will be speaking pretty quickly. That is my norm, but I also want to do what Nicole asked, which is to get through uh, as much as possible so that you can get some grounding in what it is that we published uh, at the beginning of June. And you may find yourself getting frustrated that I'm moving uh, quite a along at a good clip. And just know that um, you will have access to the slides, you'll have access to this recording, and obviously you have access to the reports. And this is a, a, the type of data, the type of report that it, it will take some time to fully digest, really understand, unpack, think about the future, how it can be used. So today is really just to give you a sampling uh, and set you up to be able to dig in deeply uh, in a more uh, leisurely pace. So here we go. Um, so as uh, Nicole mentioned, uh, this is the New England Food System Planners Partnerships Project called New England Feeding New England. And the partnership is made up of the six state uh, food system planning entities, plus uh, our very strong collaboration with Food Solutions New England, which really we are nested uh, within that regional network. And um, the, the genesis of all of this work, of this notion of having a 30% uh, regional food go uh, consumption goal by 2030, really the idea of that came out of the New England Food Vision's uh, very um, aspirational uh, goal of 50, reaching 50% regional food consumption by 2060. And our uh, partnership, uh, we were all gathered in, in Detroit uh, in 2019, and Tom Kelly from uh, UNH Sustainability Institute was present, um, to, and we were thinking about, well, what could be a nearer term uh, way to approach uh, what we're ultimately trying to achieve by, by 2060, because we need to be able to track some milestones. And so it was at this uh, conference we were all at with other food system planning entities in Detroit that we actually conceived of this idea and um, uh, and then, as Nicole said, um, after we conducted all of the research and we invited, uh, and then we and we were getting close to launching uh, the report, we invited uh, state uh, ag department partners to join our partnership, and that is just getting underway, but has already um, been really, really excellent. So, what is this report all about? What is the goal of this project? Well, it's by 2030, 30% of the food consumed in New England is produced, harvested, caught within New England. And we really want that for our collective efforts to focus on expanding and fortifying the region's food supply and distribution systems in an equitable and inclusive way that ensures the availability of adequate, affordable, socially and culturally appropriate products 
under a variety of rapidly changing climate, environmental, and public health conditions. And this became all the more real to all of us as we went through the pandemic and saw just how brittle our food supply chains can be. And so we conceived of this idea before the pandemic happened, and it turned out to be quite prescient. And it has really caught uh, people's attention, I think, be in large part because we have all gone through uh, what we went through during the pandemic uh, with noticing the changes in our supply chains. So New England has the capacity, the ability, and the ingenuity to create a food system that is more self-reliant. This, the current system presents several barriers to doing so, and we've identified those throughout this report. And so we need to come together to identify the policies, the investments that will support the public and private supply chain businesses and infrastructure in our region so that we can build a more resilient, strong regional food system where we, that means we have uh, more jobs, a healthier populace, and a greater stability of our economy, workforce, and supply chains. So as I mentioned, we got underway with this research starting uh, in 2021, actually after we raised uh, the funding to do so. We had 16 researchers that were part of the research project. Uh, we're now in phase two where, we're, where we've launched the reports and we're conducting an, a, a series of convenings and, and beginning to, to pull together the folks that are really excited about um, moving into action uh, in a more coordinated and aligned way. So uh, as Nicole said, uh, there is an executive summary that's part, mostly what I'm gonna be covering today, although I'm gonna dig into some other uh, fresh hot off of the, the press, so to speak, uh, visuals of that are New Hampshire specific that don't yet show up in any of the documents you may have taken a look at. We're about to start releasing state level briefs and there will be a New Hampshire one that will be coming out next week and Nicole will be sending that out as it um, gets finalized. So one of the first things we did of course was we took a look at well, what do we actually produce in New England? And what you can get from this graphic is that we produce a lot of different types of products in different categories. This is all from the US Census of Agriculture 2017. So it's a little outdated. We'll hopefully be getting new data from uh, USDA soon. And, but you can see that all these, are, we have a lot of, of small percentages, but yet we have a land base that could support a lot more of these very products. So that's part of what we are gonna be digging into and I'll get into more detail as we go along. The other thing that we do is we have a very strong uh, manufacturing sector of different types of food. Uh, obviously, <laughs> brewing, brewing and distilling are, 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 are well known, but we also uh, have a, a number of animal slaughtering and processing facilities. Of course, we have award-winning cheeses that are coming out of, out of um, New England. We have a number of seafood products coming out of New England. So again, there's a lot of diversity uh, of what we're actually producing in the region. Now, if we take a look at New Hampshire, based on uh, your census of ag data through your state level data, uh, you can get a snapshot here of the types of agricultural products by sales. Uh, milk from cows is your largest percentage. Uh, you have a good bit of, of vegetable production as well. You can see what the top sales are for seafood products, uh, mainly lobster. Uh, manufactured products, fluid milk, breweries, and some confectionery and sugar products. Um, and then if you take a look at uh, where are, is food being purchased uh, in the state, sort of top areas are grocery stores, 51.3%, not a surprise. Most people get their food at grocery stores. And then 33.4% in, in restaurants and fast food, um, followed by uh, direct sales being 1.6%. Uh, in terms of the overall region, some of the key findings that are uh, contained in the executive summary um, uh, are, are, are these. Um, and what we did in the executive summary was we pulled out one top level finding from each of the four main uh, volumes of this uh, research uh, package, seven different research components. So we took a look at how are we eating today? And what would it look like if we ate in a more resilient way? What would their caloric uh, intake be? And what would that mean in terms of how we would have to shift our diets? In volume two, we explored what would uh, it take to actually meet 30% 
of the servings of our growing population, a population in 2030 that's expected to be about 15.6 million people, and how much land would be required to be brought into production that currently is not today in order to achieve that, to give us a shot at achieving that 30% of servings of uh, on the production side of things. Um, in volume three, we took a look at, well, what is the um, economic impact? What is the economic relevance of the food system in New England? And we actually used the implant model and ran the analysis in all six states individually to then um, roll up into the full uh, looking at the entire region. We know that close to a, a million people are employed across the region in some job related to the food system. It's about 10% of all jobs and it generates about $190 billion worth of sales. So this is not a small sector of our economy. It's actually quite large and often is overlooked by more traditional economic development officials. And then in volume four, we looked at market channels and we really dug deep into where are folks buying and acquiring their food, including it through the charitable food system like food banks, institutions, grocery stores, restaurants, uh, correctional facilities, et cetera. And uh, we spend a lot of money uh, on food. And so what we're tr trying to pose here is we can't have New England be an island. We can't produce all everything that we would want to consume. But what would it look like? What would it take if we were to actually get to 30% by 2030? Oops. So that's, uh, as, as Nicole said, we're gonna dig in more deeply in each one of uh, your next cafe series. So um, one of the things that we started off with then after the executive summary is this is this common food system challenges backgrounder. And this is really a helpful document to take a look at because one of the things that we identified was that there were basically seven common challenges across any food system you take a look at. It, it applies to all seven states in the region, but it also applies throughout the United States. Uh, there is a real lack of planning for long-term food supplies. There is no one that's really in charge of like, do we actually produce enough food for, uh, and the type of food that we should be eating in the United States, uh, for instance. Um, we, there are lots of risks to long-term food production, especially from climate change. There are challenges to farm, fishery, and food business viability because of the consolidation in the marketplace. There's ongoing exploitation of food system workers, and, and we break all of this stuff down in terms of uh, race and class. Uh, we, there's a limited progress that has been made over the decades related to reducing diet-related health problems and reducing food and nutrition insecurity, and there's been limited progress uh, on reducing our food waste. So one of the things that's in, that I think is important to keep in mind is, is our population size. Currently, we're at about 15.3 million people in the six states, and we, it's projected that we will be increasing to... Uh, 15.6%, and we are also diversifying um, our uh, population. The demographics of our population are definitely changing. And so, but what you should take away from this chart is that, and again, no surprise probably to any of you, is that the major population centers are in the southernmost parts, southernmost parts of New England, while the more rural areas and, and also the production is in the more northern parts of the three states, and particularly in Vermont, definitely some in the northern reaches of New Hampshire, and then also primarily in Arusta County up in Maine. So what we need to do here, if we're really going to achieve thir the 30 by 30 goal, is we have to find a way to get the population centers in the southern parts of New England to care about where their food comes from and to understand and care about the food producers that are in the Northern part of the region. And we also need, of course, on the flip side, need to get producers in the northernmost parts of, of New England uh, to understand that they have huge market potential by supplying more of their products, expanding their, market, their markets into Southern New England. Now, one of the things that was one of the dr main drivers of our desire to take a look at this um, I I issue of, of what it would take to get to 30 by 30 is because we know that there is going to be increasing climate uh, vulnerability to our region. And we wanted to understand what are those projected climate risks and how do we prepare 
uh, the, our food supply for climate change, uh, not dissimilar to what happened during the pandemic when there was uh, challenges of getting food through the distribution, the national distribution system into our grocery stores. And, and more of us turn to our local farms and local fishers to buy more directly. What happens if, if, if the land and the sea uh, resources are, are not protected as they need to be in order for us to continue to count on them and to expand that production to as a mitigation and adaptation um, scenarios for climate change. So this gives you a sense of, of where there is expected to be uh, uh, high, medium, low, and no risk related to uh, extreme rains, hurricanes that come through, water stress, and then also wildfires, heat stress, and sea level rise. Uh, so, and, and of course, what's important to know is that while in New Hampshire, you, we only have you only have one county with um, a medium risk of, of sea level rise because of the small uh, amount of coastline that you all have. Because there is such a big coastline in Maine, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, as sea level rises there, there is going to be even more climate migration pressures on the northernmost states as people leave the coast because of flooding uh, to move north because they wanna stay in New England. So that's gonna put extra pressure on our land base that we have to take account of as well. Now, over the last, uh, well, since 1945, since World War II, there has been a massive migration away from rural areas and into urban areas. And that has also led to a decrease overall in agricultural land use. And while some states have stabilized over the last uh, 10 years, uh, other states in New England have continued to decline. And uh, in terms of land use in New Hampshire, uh, you can see that uh, while you have a, a good number of dairy farms, uh, that means that a lot of your uh, acreage, uh, available acreage for agricultural production is used to grow forages and corn silage uh, for the dairy and the cattle industries uh, in the region, in, in your state in particular. And you can see that according to the, the Ag Census of, of 2017, you have about uh, just shy of 3,700 acres in vegetable production and uh, about 1,700 acres in uh, orchards, 754 in berries. Um, so there's a lot, there is definitely some room here for expanding um, we have the land base, but it's about how are we using the land and for what types of products. Ellen. And in 2020, uh, American Farmland Trust uh, published a uh, seminal uh, research called Farms Under Threat 2040, uh, Choosing an Abundant Future. And that report was released uh, on, in, on February 17th, 2020 in Boston as a joint uh, conference that was also helped to organize by FSNE and uh, where they released this data. And so we, we wanted to, to amplify the use of this data because we think it's important to be able to see these business as usual scenarios. This is the, they, they, they have other scenarios in their report, but in this case, we, we chose to take a look at the business as usual scenario, because if we're looking at the historical downward trends of, of uh, maintaining land and agriculture, where is that gonna impact uh, various counties, like what's projected for certain counties based on historical trends. And you can see here that uh, in Coas County, um, there is a projected by 2040 of losing another 2,700 acres uh, of actual ag land uh, to other forms of uses. And so this should also be a, a, you know, a rallying cry for those of us that want to be expanding agriculture to think about how do we protect agricultural land for agricultural production going forward. One of the challenges, of course, <laughs> is that uh, for a lot of new and beginning farmers or existing farmers who are wanting to expand their operation, we're seeing uh, the, the value per acre of that land becoming more and more expensive. And thus, in some cases, if, especially in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Connecticut, it may be out of reach uh, for some, for some um, unless they come from uh, landed wealth or other forms of, of, of non-agricultural wealth that they 
uh, as they're getting into farming. So this is an issue that I think also we need to address at the regional scale as well as the state level scale of thinking about how is agricultural, the best agricultural land actually valued in the marketplace and how do we uh, value it in such a way that we're able to retain it in agricultural production. One of the other things that we talk about in the common challenges and throughout this report is we we talk about we show where there is the prevalence of, of food insecurity in the country. Um, and this is uh, food insecurity by race and ethnicity across the country. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, Black, Hispanic uh, uh, residents are by far experiencing uh, very high food insecurity rates. And even though the overall food insecurity rate dropped during the pandemic because of uh, the doubling of SNAP benefits, um, uh, non-white populations were affected. Uh, it did not Those rates did not come down nearly to what uh, they needed to be to, to, to basically eliminate the food insecurity in, uh, in our communities, which we really need to be moving towards ending hunger and ending food insecurity. And in New Hampshire, um, uh, you got your rates down to 5.4% in 2021, again, because of almost, a, a, because of a, basically a doubling of your SNAP benefits. Those rates were expecting to, to rise again as those SNAP benefits expire. We also did a lot to take a look at um, uh, the data from a, a racial lens. And, and in this particular case, taking a look at uh, where our uh, where are the various demographic populations actually living and what is their access to food. So there's a, a wonderful data set uh, known as LILA or the low income, low access census tract data. And it takes a look at each census tract uh, in uh, the whole country, but in this case, looking at New Hampshire and looking at where is there a concentration of poverty as well as a co and the racial profile of that poverty. And then in, in we've also been able to overlay where are the stores in relation to where people are living. And then no surprise, uh, in many cases, in areas where there is uh, a lot of uh, low income uh, families, they also have a low access to actually being able to get food within a, a reasonable distance from where they're living. And these are all things that need to be substantially addressed uh, going forward as well. So in looking at the economic impact in the region of the food system uh, in New Hampshire, you have over 92,000 people employed in the food system. And uh, your the sales in 2017 anyways was uh, over $14 billion. So you can think of this as your gross state product uh, you, you have the, the food system represents $14.1 billion worth of economic activity, both direct, indirect, and induced activity. And because we all need to eat, uh, food sales, the growth in sales, um, tends to be kind of recession proof in essence. So even uh, over time, we've seen that, uh, that unless there's a sharp decrease in the overall population, it tends to be the case that sales continue to increase even when there are uh, downturns in the economy. And how does New Hampshire relate to the other New England states? Um, you know, uh, Massachusetts obviously is the largest population, thus they have the largest number of food jobs and they have the largest uh, sales by state. But New Hampshire uh, ranks third in the, in the ratings of, of six states. Um, and uh, you can see there what your population, food system jobs, and food sales are um, as a share of, of the total. Now, one of the things we wanted to call attention to is that there's a lot of different careers in the food system, many of which do not pay sufficiently. Uh, what we did was we took a look at the, uh, the uh, MIT living wage uh, data and applied that to a number of occupational titles from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, tracked that to show where there are jobs that are falling short of a livable wage within uh, the food system. And again, this um, I, I don't think that, that you should take away from this that, oh, well, we shouldn't be investing in food system jobs because they just inherently pay less. 
I think the, the conclusion here is what can we do to support uh, food system businesses and farms to actually become more profitable so that they can afford to pay better wages and benefits? Because we need these jobs, we need uh, these workers, and we need them to have a livable wage uh, to support themselves and their families. Now, one of the other uh, interesting things to understand about New England's uh, food system, and this is not dissimilar to other parts of the country, is that um, a, a, we have a, a pretty strong um, concentration of certain types of agricultural uh, agriculture. And uh, then when you take a look at the number of farms that account for the majority of the sales, things are really quite lopsided. So here you see that the dairy and cattle industry represents a billion dollars worth of sales. And yet um, beef cattle, there are 3,400 uh, uh, farms. Um, and then we have uh, in dairy, uh, dairy and cattle, it's 1,421, as opposed to uh, you know 8,000 farms that do hay, um, that only um, leads to $236 million worth of sales. So there's really, um, it's just an area for us to spend some time on in terms of thinking about what, how might we want to actually change uh, this um, uh, in the uh, going forward. Oops, whoops. Um, and this is another way to, to understand uh, the issue around net profits is even more stark and more important for us to be looking at because when you think about New England uh, agriculture, you think a lot about small farms and, and their size. Uh, and, and we have over 21,000 farms that make less than $10,000. Now, there's, I, would, I would argue that we need to change the definition of what constitutes an actual farm for the purposes of really uh, looking at this kind of data going forward. Uh, the US Department of Agriculture um, definition of a farm in this country has not changed since the 1930s. And it basically is, you can call yourself a farm if you have at least a thousand dollars worth of sales. Back then, you know, you, you might be able to eke out a living on that, but, uh, and today you, you certainly can't. And so the thing to look at here is that it's not until you really reach about 250,000 worth of sales that you really start to earn enough of a profit that you could think about being able to support your family, maybe bringing on some additional workers, uh, at, as well as in reinvesting in your farm or food business. You're in your farm, so we we you know we, we take a look at uh, the number of farms, for instance, between five hundred thousand and, and a million dollars in sales. There's just five hundred and six of them in the whole six state region. So if we think about wanting to expand our production to reach that 30 by 30 goal, we need to be thinking about how do we uh, focus more of our resources, our technical assistance and, and investment resources into those farms that actually want to expand um, into additional acreage, additional pro food production, so that we can have a greater chance of actually having viable farms that then have the ability to feed more of the population going forward. So as I mentioned in volume one, we're estimating uh, resilient eating patterns and Brian Donahue, who was uh, one of the research team members back in 2012 to 14, when the New England Food Vision was being developed, um, was the lead, the team lead for this uh, volume one team that explored resilient eating patterns. And what they did was they started with the New England Food Vision 2014, three different scenarios and um, brought those up to current day numbers and used, uh, and that became then the baseline and then developed two different scenarios. One which looks at, well, what are we eating today? And if, and what would we be eating in 2030 if we didn't change, do any changes to our diet? we would be at on average about 2,700 uh, calories without alcohol. And that's about 400 calories more than what is um, recommended by the USDA. Uh, and then we said, well, when we convened a, ser a panel of dietitians and, and health experts, uh, nutritionists, and uh, worked with them on, on constructing and thinking about how would we adjust our eating, an eating pattern that we would call the resilient eating pattern, uh, and what would that look like in terms of caloric intake, and how would that be spread across different types of um, food categories? 
And what that looks like is we would be looking to increase our fruit consumption by two cups a day. We'd be increasing our vegetable consumption by three cups a day. We'd probably maintain our dairy consumption about what we are today at 1.5 cups a day. Um, decrease proteins just slightly, but that decrease would be, um, we would be eating more of seafood, nuts and beans and not just uh, animal protein. Uh, we'd have uh, about the same in grains, little, a little decrease in sweeteners and a decrease in fats and oils. That's how we would get to that uh, cal caloric goal of, of 2320. There's a lot more there, but Brian Donahue is going to be joining you all at your next cafe series. So he'll be able to dig in much more deeply into the data. So I'm going to move along to volume two, um, which is really about production. And um, one of the things that, uh, so we took the data from the volume one of the resilient eating, and then we said, okay, well, what would it, what are we actually producing today in the region? And what are we actually consuming today in the region? And then created a simple ratio, uh, what's called a, a regional self-reliance ratio that basically um, shows that we are, we are more than self-reliant from a 30% perspective in dairy and also in vegetables, but we are well below um, uh, regional self-reliance in fruits and proteins. It uh, looks like somebody, Betty, is is doing some drawing. Um, maybe we can um, end that. Thanks. So basically what this looks, what this indicates is that 20.7% uh, of, uh, we, we produce 20.7% of what we consume in the region. However, that does not mean that our local food consumption is 20.7% because a lot of what we produce in the region is actually exported, which is why we're doing a local food counts right now in uh, New Hampshire and uh, Maine and Rhode Island, Massachusetts and Connecticut, so we can actually get to a baseline of what are we actually eating in terms of local food uh, in each of the states. Now, we saw that in vegetables, we were actually um, over that 30% mark, but I need to say that importantly, 82% uh, of that is basically starchy, which is primarily potatoes from Maine. So, and you take a look at the other types of vegetables, dark greens, red and orange legumes, we have a lot more we could be doing to make this a little bit more um, uh, even across uh, what we're producing. On the... Um, on the level of proteins, um, obviously we're more than self-reliant in seafood. Uh, again, a lot of that leaves the region and we have uh, the ability to, to be raising and, and consuming a lot more of other types of protein if we were to raise it in, in New England. Um, when it comes to agricultural sales um, overall, uh, in New Hampshire, you can see the spread here. Um, greenhouses and nurseries, which is not for food consumption, uh, is your largest uh, agricultural product, followed by dairy uh, at 42 million, vegetables and melons at 20 million, and on its way down to, um, uh, let's see, other, other animals at 3.5 million. And in terms of the value of your seafood landings, about uh, 27 million. Uh, that's a decrease over a high of 2018, um, but uh, so something to take a look at there, um, uh, a variety of reasons. And we actually have a whole seafood supplement that dives deep into these issues, as well as a treatment of existing seafood uh, production uh, in volume two. Now, as I said, uh, in order to achieve that 30% mark, based on the servings, of what we identified the servings needed to be in um, in volume two related to the diets in volume one, what we arrived at through a very complex uh, uh, model that Chris Peters from the UV, uh, from USDA ARS produced, we need to uh, increase, uh, better utilize existing cropland, 400,000 acres of existing cropland, and then we need to bring uh, 590,000 more new acres of cropland into production in order to uh, achieve that 30% RSR. In volume four, we, we do a deep dive into markets um, and 
we uh, identified here, we wanted to really show in a, I think a very visually like capturing kind of way, we spend in New England $85.5 billion on food. 46% of that or, or $39.54 billion is at grocery stores and supermarkets. And yet that is the hardest market for us to break into in terms of our local products. Next is, is restaurants and fast foods. We spend an inordinate amount of time um, trying to get into food service contracts, uh, and that, and yet that represents 3.7% uh, of total sales, which is important, and we should be doing that. It helps in so many ways. There's a lot of food access involved in that. However, it's I guess the point of this is really that it's insufficient. We need to figure out how to break into the grocery and to the restaurant markets more with our local food. Uh, direct sales, uh, farmers markets, CSAs, farm stands, et cetera, is 0.3% of all sales across the region or just $293 million. In New Hampshire, it looks like this. You're spending about $8.4 billion uh, on food every year. Uh, 4.3 billion of that is at grocery stores. So just think in terms of how much more money would be staying local and in the pockets of producers if we could get more of their products into grocery stores uh, and at a price point that works for them. That's another part of this, of course. Um, in New Hampshire, you have a lot of different types of stores. Independent stores represent 105 of them. Um, what's really important here is to think about independently owned stores similar to what we're doing with trying to get into hospitals and schools and universities, uh, for instance. Uh, in that they are locally owned. And so we have a greater ability to influence and inform them about why it's really a helpful thing to do to both sell more, but also to differentiate against the large chains. Because we have, and New Hampshire has almost as many Dollar Tree, Dollar Value, and Dollar General stores as you have independent stores. And then their Hannaford's has 38 um, stores throughout the, the state, for instance. They have a very strong local program. Um, that could be they could be doing more. Um, but again, I, I think that there's a strategy to be developed in New Hampshire uh, to look at Hannaford's market basket, for instance, your food co-ops uh, and uh, some of these other uh, stores, along with the independents, who might be more open to actually sourcing more uh, local food. Ellen, this so, is your warning that you're yep, going to get a Q and A soon. Yes, very soon. Yes. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, direct sales is a very small uh, percentage of the total sales. Um, and uh, one of the other things that we did was we looked at how much are people spending on food of their total expenditures of all the major categories of what they spend their dollars on annually. And food represents a little over twelve percent of our of our total dollar spend. So we broke down what kinds of food is, is purchased. Uh, this is all from consumer expenditure surveys that the USDA um, has published. And the, the, the bottom line here is if to get to 30%, if New Hampshireites are spending close to $7,000 a year on food in 2030, if they were to shift, if you all were to shift what you're purchasing by basically $2,000 a year, we could, then you all could be at 30%. So that doesn't mean adding to the total you're spending on food. You're it's talking about shifting from what, you're, what New Hampshireites are currently spending on and what they could be spending on if they had greater access and we had greater production of local product and available where people shop. So a few takeaways uh, about how you can get involved. Um, stay involved with the New Hampshire Food Alliance. Uh, Nicole and her team are doing a fabulous job uh, and uh, we definitely want uh, you all to consider spearheading a, a New Hampshire food system strategic plan. We have one in Vermont, New uh, a second one, actually a second 10-year plan in Vermont. Rhode Island is currently doing their second five-year plan. Uh, Maine and Massachusetts and Connecticut are all considering uh, doing uh, more robust strategic planning as well. Um, and we also want to encourage, um, we're, we're also going to be trying to have a conversation about how could we get all six New England states to have roughly the same local food definition. So what is the definition of New Hampshire local? 
uh, that would be great to get through your legislature. And then, as I mentioned, we're conducting a local food count in New and New Hampshire is uh, fully engaged with currently with um, collecting the data uh, over the next couple of months. We hope to have that report out at the beginning of the year. Um, encourage you to keep reading the reports and use the research to support your work and identify ways that your organization can align and contribute to this 30% by 2030 regional goal. And that's what I got for you. So I think um, we can now open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, you're gonna probably have to reshare some slides as we go back. You had a lot of questions throughout. Um, we've been, Colleen and I have been trying to comb through them. Um, many of them were already answered. So let's see, does anyone have hands raised? I'll, so we have, um, there were a lot of questions about um, clearing existing forest land to grow food. Could you speak a little bit to how that's considered in the data and, and thinking? Yeah, we didn't get into, into a lot of detail on that. It was really just identifying, it was really a mathematical question. What If we really wanna have 30% of servings, how much land do we need? And what do we currently have in agri-production? What's that delta? So in the case of clearing, I think what we're, we're, we're considering here is there's an awful lot of agricultural land that has gone back into forest. So that would be sort of the first place to start is areas on the edges of existing fields that maybe have not been um, cultivated in a long time uh, and to bring those back into production. Uh, as, as some of you may know, uh, FSNE is also uh, collaborating with a number of partners on the Wildlands, Woodlands, and Communities update, and they're looking at this same question from a forest perspective. So we're starting to have conversations about the intersection between healthy forest ecosystems and uh, a land base that supports the kind of food production that we need in the region. Thank you. Um, this is a quick-ish one. Our schools considered in the markets um, slides and section, are schools considered part of food service contractors? Correct. I think they are. Yeah. Yeah. So Rachel, and, that was and yours. Some, and, and in some cases, if they're, I mean, for instance, if they are um, self-ops, they're going to be in there as well, because it's really about what is the market channel as opposed to who operates them. Um. Did you consider any, do we consider any wild harvested protein beyond seafood? Um, Rachel mentioned so how many deer are hunted and consumed in New Hampshire. No, we we um, intentionally um, decided that we couldn't try to capture that in large part because that data is doesn't exist or it is not kept um, on a in a uh, a regularized way and it, it, and we really were looking at dollars. So, for instance, we also don't take into account. Um, uh, people having gardens, for instance, or having homesteads, uh, we for the for the purposes of this exercise, we were really trying to identify what does it, what is the dollar value of what we're producing in the region, what are we selling in the region. So obviously, for an individual family, you are maybe cutting back on how much is being spent relative to other families if you are hunting, if you are fishing, if you have a you're putting food by from your garden, that just means you're spending dollar wise less on food, but that means that you're probably getting to 30% or more faster. So all good stuff. There's just certain realities of, of working with data sets that we just can't get around in these cases. Love to know that. We also didn't, uh, we also did, we're not able to get to, to dig into urban agriculture and what is the value, for instance, of 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 lots that are um, inner city lots, for instance, that are being brought back into uh, local production. Again, that data just is not really there yet. And I just heard about some a potential survey and source of data about growing food in New Hampshire on at homesteads um, that we might be able to partner with in the future. Um, but I'm going to transition us to another question. So, the 27 percent of production number. Um, so I, I'll try and explain the regional self-reliance number. Ellen, you can correct me here, but it's it's sort of a theoretical. What are we eating as a region? What are we growing as a region? And then how do those two data sets overlap? Um, and so that you might be grow you might be growing blueberries in Maine, and we might be eating blueberries in New Hampshire. But are we eating 
so the 27% speaks to that, but are we eating the blueberries from Maine? We don't know right now. <laughs> um, and so it's a theoretical that um, resilience calculation. Does that, Ellen, do you wanna try and explain it better? Pretty, pretty close, good job. Um, it's 20.7%, not 27%, that's important. 20.7%, so you could say 21%. So basically across all food categories, what are we producing? Pound by pounds, those those metrics are pounds. Then what are we consuming in pounds? That is a ratio then of what are we consuming versus what are we producing? That's how you get to the 20.7%. But because so many Maine blueberries leave the region, lobster leaves the region, dairy products leave the region, maple products leave the region, we don't actually consume 20.7% of meaning 100% of what we actually grow here or raise or catch here, right? We we produce uh, 20%, we, we, we produce 20.7% of what we we are in fact eating, but not all of that, uh, what we're producing is being consumed in the region, it's being exported. So the big question is how do we shift and retain more of what we produce to be consumed in the region, but then how do we also expand production to achieve that 30% by 2030 goal? Great. And they said, thank you, Elizabeth said, thank you. That clarifies, I hope it clarifies for others. It took me a bit to grasp that nuance there. Um, we have a request to look at figure 17 and just comment on it a little bit more. It says, would you be willing to discuss figure 17 more? Um, I don't sure. remember what 17 that up. was. Um, figure 17, actually, I don't know my numbers of figures. Do you, do, what was, what was the topic? Maybe it was this. Um, I'm not sure I'm waiting for him to, it's John, um, Frisk, I believe wrote that comment in. If you want to, there's one. It's slide 34, Ellen. There we go. Yeah. So uh, this is the New England Farms by value of sales. So what this shows is across the six states, each one of these bars has the six states uh, sales data in it. So for instance, if you take a look at the dairy cattle, 1 billion in sales, Vermont represents 21% of that 1 billion is, is Vermont dairy sales. Maine is the next bar up and so forth. So you see across all different product types of products, what is the value of the sales of those different products? So for instance, in vegetables and melons, it's $448 million annually. Now, if you, the, the, to the right of that, what that's showing is uh, of the numbers of farms in those different product categories, what are the sales amounts of those product categories, not by state, but by sales. So the one on the left is, is sales by those product categories by state, and the one on the right is by uh, sales uh, of, of the, the, those product categories, not by state. So for instance, in, uh, in the same example of, of uh, vegetables, for instance, 3,295 uh, farms, you can see of those farms, how many are making less than a thousand, how much, how many are, are uh, how many farms um, are having sales of a of thousand to, to, to 2,500 in sales of that product category across the six states in, uh, in terms of the number of total, as a percentage of the total farms. I get that this is a little complex uh, and definitely worth reading the text that goes along with this graphic because um, it will uh, elucidate things a lot more. But the bottom line is uh, in New England, we have 32,336 farms that are producing $2.9 billion in sales. And this is an attempt to break it down by product category, by state, and by sales volume uh, by product category. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. I'm just trying to keep up with all the comments here. Um, and Rachel, I just want to say I agree. Rachel said that um, she finds this very hopeful and exciting because it provides a lot of data to use to seek funding. 
um, for your work. And that's one of the very central intentions, I think, of this compilation of data. Um, Absolutely. And if anybody ever needs it, uh, you know, all of this, uh, the data, these, these graphics are in JPEG form. And if there's something in particular that you need uh, for a presentation or to include uh, an actual graphic um, in uh, something that you're producing, just be in touch with, with uh, Nicole and she has access to it all. Absolutely. Um, I think we should, it's, um, it's hard to keep up with all the questions. I think we answered a lot of them and that you'll have a chance to, to dig into the volumes as we go through with the lead researchers. Um, let's take this last one here and then and wrap up from there. Um, is anyone working on this project also keeping an eye on the new USDA Climate Smart Commodity Program? Oh, Ellen, do you wanna try to respond to that one? Um, keeping an eye on, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, I mean, any of the new programs, especially if there's funding, all of the state partners and our state agencies of de uh, departments of agriculture are, are keeping an eye on, on on funding opportunities. If there's new data coming out, uh, we would definitely want to be uh, keeping an eye out for that. In fact, that con that uh, consumer expenditure data that I showed you literally literally came out three weeks before we were ready to publish, <laughs> and we scrambled and were able to include that data, uh, which basically got to what's the dollar amount that would get a, a, a personal consumption to get to thirty percent. So. Um, when new data comes, we get very excited. So uh, if you if you come across stuff you think we should know about and we may not, uh, send it along. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ellen, for being here and presenting all of this and for spearheading this initiative. Um, I want to say that I think one of the most incredible parts of what Ellen has done with this partnership is bring the, the six state food system planning networks together. So I, for example, get to learn from her regularly, learn from what they've done in Vermont, learn from what they're doing in Rhode Island, and bring that information back to New Hampshire. And also, I think New Hampshire is leading in some really new and innovative ways. Um, so it's been just a phenomenal partnership. And I appreciate you being here, Alan, and to, to speak directly to us all about that. Um, I do see that we didn't answer some questions, but I'm going to um, ask that we'll we'll try and follow up with some of them um, or come to future network cafes. We have Colleen put our network cafe evaluation in the chat. It's just less than 30 seconds. So just please take that. That's something you can do to help us keep these cafes informative and engaging and valuable for you. Um, and make sure to register for the rest of the series. You just register once typically, but this month was an anomaly. Um, because we didn't want, we were avoiding Labor Day weekend. Um, Colleen, what did I miss? Nothing. Um, thank you all for being here. And we look forward to continuing this series with all of you in October. Thanks so much. Good luck, everybody. Go, go, New Hampshire. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> Take care. Everyone.